Happy Friday afternoon, everybody. Welcome to another MSP Cyber Roundtable. Uh, today we're doing something kind of cool. Uh, well, every week we do something pretty cool, but this week we're doing something cool for the first time, which is we're doing a uh, like a, a what's happening with cybersecurity call. Um, so we're going to be taking a, a position and a, a look back at each quarter um, on the different things that happen in cybersecurity, whether it be um, an interesting uh, event that happens out in the world or an interesting event that happens um, within um, governance or I don't know, what have you, um, interesting piece of technology, something along those lines. Um, and we're going to be bringing up those exciting topics and having a discussion as a team and sending that conversation out to you guys. So I know we have five interesting topics today that I'm really excited about. And I'm excited to be here with Danny and Matt. And I'm excited for it to be Friday. Um, and I made a cheesecake today. How are you guys? <laughs> the cheesecake, is it? Is it? It turned out better than the last one. So it's going to go faster than the last one? Now, if 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 the cheesecake was uh, a pie chart of how far along I was completed with a gap analysis, it would be <laughs> more than a fourth completed with a gap analysis. You're doing a really good job there, and those folks. In Some the people Trust say Mark ninety cohort, minutes. <laughs> Some people in the Trustmark cohort need to look out. <laughs> <laughs> I just, uh, I had my second lunch just now, so I'm also feeling similarly uh, accomplished. <laughs> accomplished. I love that. Danny. How are you, Danny? How are the pups? Uh, they're doing good. They're just lazing out. Are they enjoying they're... it getting warm down there in Florida? Uh, they're enjoying, they will complain they went inside. It's too hot. Oh, it's too. <laughs> Are you in this the part of Florida where it's humid? Uh, <laughs> that that, whole of... <laughs> that's gonna hit next month. Next oh, month. Okay. So you're in this. You're still. It's nice. You're still uh, just catching tans and stuff. Yeah, it's not humid. It's just warm and doesn't matter too much. But yeah, end of May, June, the humidity comes in, and you don't go outside until December. <laughs> Do you guys have squirrels, or is it just iguanas? No, lots of squirrels. Okay. I was in the part of Florida where there's just iguanas. I didn't see it. I never saw That squirrels. must have been farther south. I was further south, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, for those, for, those, uh, th for those just watching, uh, maybe for the first time today, or, or even people that know us already, Zach and I are pretty far north. And, um, yeah. like, I just see like tiny little like leaf buds out of my window like this big and it's you know it's it's in it's in like it's in the 50s which is like great and zach i think you're pretty similar there right or um, it's 58 yeah. uh and i haven't put long pants on in two weeks so there you go yeah and Dan except for now i'm in my business run. slacks for for like for these calls he's getting ready to run from the from the weather um so we had a humongous quarter one uh, when we sat down to grab some some articles. I was like, man, how do we even figure out what's at the top of this pile? And we just we just dove in and grabbed some. But um, should we jump in? I think we went through a pretty in-depth process of figuring it out. I think you're selling it short. I think we what? I think we went, went through some detail, but I'm excited to go through it for sure. Yeah. Well, we got. Uh... All right. So cyber trends from quarter one. Wait, uh, before we go in, I want to ask you, what is happening with cybersecurity, Matt? Well, for us in Fort Mesa, it seems like the last six months have been like the moment in the uh, technology adoption curve where technologists um, took off their geek hat and said, oh, I need to like formally like get really good at locking my doors and windows and they've been taking compliance really really seriously um this year that's certainly a big thing um the other thing i've seen sort of at the same time um while the government and the people in the government writing laws um are marching forward here and they're always like trying to solve everything with laws 
I've, the, the trend I've seen the last half year is they're actually stepping back and, and, and letting cyber professionals and technologists step forward on driving um, the, you know, where things should go. So I think those things go together, which is, you know, when, when, is that when a the technologist. New, <laughs> is that new momentum? It's totally new momentum. And I'm not sure which thing came first. It just, it seems like um, as the technology industry has really formalized their adoption of cybersecurity at the same time, the government's been stepping back to make, to make room for it. But we're on razor's edge here, which is that if we, if there's a large, what we sometimes say, a correlated loss event, like basically if we as an industry screw up, right, um, we, we could lose that ground. So I'm, I'm. I, this is sound. I hate the question because it sounds like, actually, I'm going to play dumb. What's a correlated loss event? Okay. So <laughs> we're going to talk about it later. But um, as an example, down when uh, Katrina hit the Gulf in, in the U.S., it caused so many um, hurricane related damages that, um, the carriers and even the reinsurers went belly up. Like the people that were supposed to be paying the carriers when they can't cover the losses also couldn't cover the losses Hmm. because there was a giant correlated incident that doesn't usually happen in insurance land. Right. Um, usually you use one set of people, their premiums pay for another set of people's losses. Right. And it all sort of works out in the end. But when you have a, a big correlated loss incident, which which is the way the insurance industry looks at it, but we could look at that systemically as a society, right? If enough, if there's enough of a correlated loss event across yeah. our economy, right? Sure. The world is just not going to let us be in charge. Yeah, they're going to do it. <laughs> so that makes sense. Danny, what that. about from a technology perspective? What's new in the world of cybersecurity from, from the the zeros and ones and the nuts and bolts. It seems like um, people are starting to get pressure to get this um, AI vulnerability checking going. Oh, well, AI security, well, the whole, the whole world. Yeah. It's been a yeah. box opened up this year. I mean, they've been talking about it, but now there's actually movement and making a product. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. We've got some friends working on some secret products, some friends working on some not so secret products in that realm. But then we've got, um, uh, you know, NIST came out with uh, their AI security model, uh, yeah. I think sometime over the last year, they're working on their uh, their second version. So this is a standard by the US government about how to secure AI systems. Um, but anyway, that, that came out um, almost a year ago, I believe. And but they're already talking about version two because you know the first yeah. the first stab wasn't quite basically wasn't a quite rough there. draft is what they put yeah. the first yeah. yeah. So well, I, but we'll yeah, see. We'll something see. Else people could talk. There's a, <laughs> there's a big question mark there, right? We we uh, we're just figuring out formalized cybersecurity, right? The, I think I think secure AI is going to be a minute. Yeah, I'm sure that's true. Um, well, I know you guys were getting ready to ask Zach, well, what's happening in cybersecurity school? <laughs> I finally got far enough through uh, my like transitionary classes to be to have enough networking background to be into some GRC stuff. Um, so if you can believe it, this is the uh, the set of classes are comfortable for me. <laughs> it's I'm familiar yeah. with some of the some of the it's concepts. Interesting. Because that's the advanced layer on top. Um, I can't wait to see. I can't wait to see how you score against your peers there. <laughs> I hope that I don't struggle. You know, I think you may be doing a guest speaking, which would be pretty cool. We we look forward to hopefully having that happen. So that's what's happening in cybersecurity at a top level. Let's look at some of these. Uh... Yeah, should we go into the first issue here? Yeah, let's. So I mean, this one. Um, I put this one at the, th this topic at the uh, beginning because this was like, we were two weeks into January. because you wanted January. to rile me up right away. <laughs> we were two weeks into Janu January. Um, there was a primary campaign going on. Um, we can dig into the details in a minute, but the first AI robocall to reach um, national attention, let's say, or international attention um, was launched during that primary event. It was a, it was a synthetic joe biden um uh saying some i really like how you said that 
I <laughs> wish that I could make a ringtone of you just saying synthetic Joe Biden. Yeah, I guess so I could our, actually. Our not so Joe Biden friend encouraged people not to go out to the polls. Um, oh my God. Ter- turned out it was a minor impact from an election perspective, um, oh, as shit. if Joe Biden like really needed to worry about not not getting the nomination. But uh, big deal in AI circles. It made international news, like it, in the main main news cycle, actually for a few weeks. But um, then most of the world as forgot it about should. it. But, Because, I mean, if that was, you know, you could put a campaign together at a time, at a moment, at a scale where that would be seriously a problem. I I wish that it had made bigger waves, frankly, or that they had been more sustained because people really need to be on the lookout for that kind of thing to really ask hard questions of the information that's being fed to them and um, think critically. But in any case, it washed out of the mainstream. But in AI circles, there's the shockwaves keep coming. Um. Uh, we've got, um, <laughs> I, I, I don't remember the exact timeline. I think the first piece of, of what happened that sort of leaked out was the voice actor, not the, that like raised his hand and said, oh yeah, that was me. I created the deep fake. Um, I was hired for like 500 bucks to like create this thing and didn't seem quite right, but I needed the money and I did it anyway. And he like owned up to the media. Um. And as, as far as I know, he's not in any serious trouble because he owned up. Um, was he the guy but, who like wrote who was like the programmer of the AI? Or like, so what? he was just he was just doing gig work, man. People were like, "Hey, five hundred bucks for a deep fake, bam, oh, bam." He, he was doing like, like Joe Biden and stuff. What was it that he actually did? I forget. I mean, me. he just it was a few sentences of "Don't don't bother showing up to the polls," right? Um, the important ones in November, and then he. But he used spoke it, or he coded it. He software. He spoke it. He spoke it, and then he used some commercial software that you can use for deep fakes because that's a thing now, right? And uh, and, and he cooked up the file and returned okay. it back to as the, as the piece of gig work, mm-hmm. and um, but the the big deal is that this was an actual official campaign manager that ran this campaign he's in big trouble okay um and the attorney general and lawmakers were trying to figure out is this even illegal yet and of course they you know uh, we've got now the fcc has you know just really like a few weeks later released new rules and they're like yeah this is definitely illegal you can't robocall ai for elections well it makes um, me I, i'll say this i mean first of all like the attempt is spooky because it's like, uh, you know, but the fact that the the response is so quickly to not allow that type of thing makes me happy. I'm hoping that they don't allow, allow robocalling in general and not just the misuse of it. That's the funny thing. Yeah. It's illegal uh, except for politicians like everything else. <laughs> oh, great. Oh, yeah. God. And and but meanwhile, we've got billions of of calls. It, it happens anyway. Yeah, because our, te- our our telecom networks are really not that secure and they're intentionally not oh. secure by the people who run them. Um, they're you know, they'd be, they'd be losing out on some revenue. Yeah, they'd be losing out on revenue. Oh. And the FCC, no, like, like not for the way that the that was, meant to fix it. Yeah, I think I they, saw recently there's going to be I don't know if that's also the FCC. It uh, is. But an infrastructure update, or at least a. a I, I I wrote an article about this, believe it or not, five years ago, where I predicted, like that nothing was going to happen, oh, and it's still. still. There, somebody's <laughs> somebody maybe maybe needed to have cited you. Hold on. I'm gonna I'm gonna throw it up there if anyone's curious about fact checking me on my my future prediction abilities. But well, if you're the, gonna uh, if you're gonna throw it up, make sure to go off cam. <laughs> That, you know, basically, like, this has been going on forever in terms of the robocalls and, um, and, and caller ID fraud and such. And, uh, you know, the FCC has basically just been looking the other way because they're run by the telecoms. And, uh, you know, I wrote this. I, I, this telecoms. was 20, 2018, right? I'm looking into, well, why isn't this fixed yet? And there were some theoretical technical fixes. Um, here, Zach, can you throw this up uh, someplace? Oh, actually, I've got the... I'm not I got the, the control here. I got the ticker. I'll take it um, to look at it. Here it is. So speaking of ticker, look at that thing on the screen. That's that makes me feel like I uh what is that thing? 
the uh, we can't see it on there. No. I opened the article you sent me. In, in any case, major, there's there's this the there's joke. this stir shaken protocol that was invented to try to lock down the telecom networks and the telecoms are like have been they invented the protocol but then have been dragging their feet as slow as possible and we are more than 10 years into implementation and it's still not done. So and the FCC's just like sitting there like, "Oh yeah, you guys, uh, why don't you come up with the implementation timeline?" And um in any case, it's not it's not happening. We're not locking down teleco the way that we the, the way we should. And so things like this happen. But you know, in in addition to that, um, Matt, you know, is the Sarah, solution just to go to iMessage? Well, I, I, that's what I talk about in the article, which is like basically like it's not a great solution. I, I'm not pitching it as a solution, but uh, but the public telephone networks with phone numbers are just going to be dead. You know, they're just. Um, that kind of makes no sense a little bit. Yeah. Oh, I just well. Anyway, I like my phone number, Matt. We got we got lost here. I remember. But, it. Uh, what the FCC said is you can only do AI robocalls if someone uh, gives you permission uh, for politics, and I just I can't imagine uh, you know in a political campaign anyone's gonna be like yes please robocalls run by AI that's gonna help me make my decisions about who to vote for. Oh, so it's the it's the receiver that makes the decision, or it's the person. Yes, that's someone's got to pre-approve it, um, and they put a fifteen hundred dollar fine behind it. But the reality is, um, get get ready for a whole lot of this. It is April now, right? Things are going to heat up by June, and we're all going to be getting AI robocalls. My podcasts really nothing... are about to be a lot of fun to listen to. Yeah, <laughs> there's uh, there's not much stopping it right now. So I don't I don't know. Uh, we don't know. Need to go any deeper there? Should we? <laughs> Should we jump into the next one here? Oh, uh, hold on, man. I don't know. I mean, I think I I would love to before we get too far away from elections. I think um, AI in politics and elections is a like in general a big thing. Um, I don't know, man. The elections are important. So this guy, this guy got in trouble pretty quickly. They figured out who ran the campaign. It, like, um, he did not own up to it. He was caught. Let me, let me say that first. Okay. He did not immediately own up to it. He was caught hmm. the campaign manager. And, um, um, you know, he insisted that, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, it, it was someone running against Biden in the primaries had nothing to do with it. Um, it was all his idea. And uh, he did it to point, point the finger at AI to make the public aware. Um, and I'm, <laughs> and and somehow that story stuck. He must have hired a really great PR agency. Um, Poor lawyer. So whether whether that's true or not, I'm not sure. I believe it, but that's the current story: is that this guy raised his hand and is like shouting, yeah, "Push and, it, T's lawyer." <laughs> yeah, that's why he did it. So. I mean, he's, he's right. The public does need to know about this stuff. But honestly, I think we're going to see a whole bunch more of it. And I'm not sure everyone like this was one campaign in a not very important election. When things start heating up, I no, they're not all going to get caught. I don't want any robots be... calling me, Matt. How about that? Yeah, well, how about none of the robots call me? Is that a, are, we, is, are we allowed to take that position politically? Uh, we could try. We could try. Like, I don't want him to call me about the campaign. I don't want him to call me. I don't want him to call well, me. Well, what about what about when you go onto Google and you go, hey, order that yeah. pizza, right? And Google says, okay, um, that restaurant hasn't um, signed up for an order system integration. So my AI is going to call up that restaurant and see if they've got availability for a table, book a reservation, actually order a pizza. Um, and that's been happening now for for a minute and you know there's i don't want him to call me yeah that's all yeah yeah so but if there's if there's a person on the other end that's like sending their ai agent out there is that how do you feel about that is it if it's especially trained to do what it is that it's sending it out to do and i'm so a business it, yeah that's okay with me as long as it functions. But if it doesn't function, I would feel the same as if it was a disorderly customer that didn't function, you know, of well, which I've had. I'll bet at least a few people didn't show up to that primary. Because <laughs> Joe Biden said so.
Don't, don't bother coming out. I just am not going to make any political <laughs> jokes, so we just need to go to the next one now. <laughs> all right, all right. I'm done with this one, too. Uh, which leads, actually, this is the perfect segue, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, this one's okay. mine. Forgive this me. This one's yours. I got to pull up the name article. I'm so sorry. I got so far into that topic. Oh, yeah. So this is uh, the thing that sparked this was Gemini. Uh, when Gemini came out and they weren't quite getting the colors right on folks and they weren't quite getting the like the historical significance of things correct. And, um, you know, it was this moment for me where it was like, OK, <laughs> we're we're creating artificial intelligence, but the intelligence that we're creating isn't accurate. Is that intelligence? This seems like there's some suboptimal elements of the situation here. Kind of how well, what, the, you know, the, the story. Oh, wait, though, let me go yeah. further. Let okay. me go further. So part of me was, you know, was concerned about that with Google Gemini at first. And then I started to think about it. And if I wanted to run one hell of a marketing campaign where everybody heard about my artificial intelligence tool and was motivated to try it for the comedy of how foul it was, they kind of nailed that. So if somebody's a genius over there and knows how to run a pretty neat castle maneuver with their king and king and rook, that's pretty uh, fucking funny marketing. All right. So I, I'm not going to deny it's possible someone in the Google org saw that opportunity. It's, it's a little while everybody. Up. The backstory here is back in 2015 when they were first, I mean, they were pioneers in this stuff. Um, they got in trouble in 2015. Okay. So that's nine years ago um, for uh, racist AI. Um, they were, Oh, so they were too safe here. Because they got in trouble for racist AI, so now they were so far on the other side of the scale. Yeah, they got in trouble specifically, out. and I it made waves at the time, so I don't mind pointing to this specific well, that thing that happened, sense. which was they they trained their AI on white people. And um, guess what Wait, happens when you throw again. a gorilla sure in... I heard it. Wait, say it again. They trained their AI on white people. On white people. And Exclusive. no one... And mostly. And... Yeah. No one running the, the training campaign even it, it didn't even occur to them until they exposed it to the public and people started throwing like, like you know I don't I don't remember the exact photos but I do remember people trying it out and you could take pictures of a gorilla in the zoo. No, and, no. And uh, and then you could take a picture That's of, of your family members and have it labeled the same way and it was it was a big deal and and Google basically oh. stepped back from the AI efforts for nine years as a result of that. And it's the reason why we haven't heard much about AI from Google for so long. It wasn't ready yet. They have been using AI in some invisible ways, but uh, I, I mean, that image labeling stuff, frankly, works pretty good now, but nine years ago, it did not. And they decided not to release this stuff until it's fully baked and um, chat GPT. Yeah, I mean it works great now. The image labeling yeah. works great. We've all been training it with our uh, with our uh, captcha clicking for the last ten years. Oh, you're so... lying. <laughs> Is that true? Yeah, it's true. Um, for more than ten years, really. So th I just thought they were really worried I was a robot. <laughs> <laughs> so that's been happening, um, and you know Microsoft really snuck up on them. And frankly, they released ChatGPT before it was ready, really. Um, it was not really, like it uh, had problems. It still has problems. Yeah. And it has these types of problems. But, you know, through the through the lens of, of PR, where you can label something as in progress, people are now accepting of that. Yeah. And- um, Well, and with stuff like this that does have tremendous value, it's like, yeah, it's not perfect, you know? It's like, yeah, so, my my really really cool thing isn't perfect. Still, yeah, I mean, really, really Ge cool Gemini's thing. been in the labs a long time, and they basically pulled it out of beta, and threw it out to the world because, well, Microsoft they needed did to it. be a part of it. Yeah, they needed to be a part of the conversation. 
Well, I mean, they certainly erred on the side of uh, they certainly didn't make the same mistake, even though they kind of made. They the didn't same make mistake. the same mistake. That's true. They, they made a similar mistake. mistake, though. But you're right. It's 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 this thing of okay. Yeah. There's this spectrum of wrong, and then there's there's this plate place in the middle that's right ish. And yeah. but who decides what that is? We can't even agree amongst ourselves yeah. in society what's right ish yeah well and that's that's the piece like that's the limitation of ai that i think is like well there's kind of two pieces of this that excite me the most one we're the one that's that are telling it what the information is so really the limitation of ai i mean garbage in garbage out right a little bit so I think I heard recently people are moving, starting to move a little bit further away from large language models and towards smaller, more specific things because yeah. the targeting is more efficient, uh, is more effective. And I think that makes a lot of sense to me. I think that might affect, you know, positive change in the AI space. And I think that also is less scary when you think about like, oh, like an AI that could be potentially dangerous wouldn't be the AI that has a very specific single function, but maybe, but I'm not an AI expert. So, you know, I'm talking kind of, well, we had, we, we've, we've had AI experts here on the show. Uh, we talked to one pretty recently yeah. um, and they're using AI to interact with um, MSP workflows. Right. And it's, yeah. It's trained specifically around the types of issues that happen in an M MSP. Yeah. And so you're right. It's, it's, we can, I think as an MSP industry, we can actually decide what the right answer is, right? The right, right answer is the one that makes the customer happy, keeps the system up, like closes, closes the security problem down. You know, like we, we have, we agree on best practices in industry broadly, right? Yeah. Um, and so you're right. Those more specific applications don't don't suffer from the same issues. But um, I, I want to make two other points related to the limitations of AI. That so one, um, I think biology is really complex. I think as like biological organisms, I think we're really complex. And I think there's a little bit of hubris in suggesting that the thing that we're creating is more complex than us. I think it's more complex than us in some ways, but I think biological organisms are really, really complex. Um, and not just humans, like the birds flying around out there, like everything has taken a long time to be here. Um, and it's pretty complex. So I think there's some elements of like, I don't love the the idea that AI is just like going to be more complicated and better than us. I think there are things that it's going to be able to do better than us. And and I think so there's a limitation of AI in a way that I thought of that I wanted to like say. Um, and then uh, the last piece is AI is really limited by resources, most of all. Um, that's a really I would important love to one. hear you think, talk yeah. about that. I mean, uh, Danny, you're probably more knowledgeable here about where we are in the, the adoption curve of GPU scaling, but we reached a place of CPU scaling, um, ceiling. When did when did Intel break Moore's law? Was that uh, close to 10 years ago now, was, Danny? Yeah, Do you remember? More than 10 years ago, like 15. Yeah, so Intel, years. you know, big processing powerhouse, silicone powerhouse, um, couldn't make processors faster anymore. Um, and they have been doing that for more than 30 years, uh, 40 years, 50 years, something like that. They've been, there'd been a really steady rate of speed improvement on the processors. And they basically hit a physics limitation that um, is really, really difficult to overcome. I mean, it's not the kind of thing that just like a few more years of technology is gonna change. Um, no, they'll have to change the whole chip designs and everything. It's well, and it's getting so we, small. We're hitting the limits of the atoms. Right, right. We've done that, um, but we still make our microchips out of atoms, right? Yep. <laughs> and 
And like, you can't really get smaller than that. And so we, what we've done with the chip designs is we've now like separated out and we have parallel cores, right? But there's limits there too. Um, you know, your iPhone's not gonna get faster forever. Um, at, at some point, there's just gonna be a, a power limitation in terms of how much power density you can push through the thing. And the same thing's gonna happen in GPUs. And in, in some ways it's already happening. We, we went through a steep adoption curve of GPUs getting faster. They're not gonna get faster forever. GPUs are not necessarily the technology that's gonna push AI to the next okay, level. There are some cool. other microchip and silicone technologies to do that, but it's not clear that they're not gonna, the same thing's gonna happen. So basically what I'm saying is there is there is a ceiling to AI performance governed by physics and frankly, electricity demand. So unless we invent um, unlimited free energy, which, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe in our life, Somebody's working probably on not. Uh, Look, working on the next phase, it's gonna help it a lot. I mean, it's gonna let us double what we're doing now, but we're still gonna have to limit again. Right. And, and what was it that they did with Iron Man, Matt? Could we just do that? <laughs> we need zero point chest cavities. Yeah. Um, so I so, OK, that that's the backdrop. And in AI, AI has gotten better every year, guys. But mostly it's because it's been using more and more electricity um, and more and more money has been poured into it to scale up those data centers. But at a certain point, there is going to be a limit where we can't pour more money into that hole to make the data centers faster. Um, and so at that point, is the AI really going to get smarter? It's certainly going to be smarter than it is today. But this idea that it's just going to keep going up like that is perhaps not realistic. I agree. And I like I, that. because I think a lot of the sense. issue is also how we train it. We just force feed the data randomly. I think we need a better training method. We do that to ourselves too. Well, you're right, Zach. So you're you take um, exercise and, and your physical body training really seriously, right? And like an uh, that science in AI is probably what's going to push us forward in the future, not throwing more horsepower at it. Yeah. Fair enough. All right. Well, we beat up AI. That it's going to keep coming back, man. I don't think we're going to let go of this one this year. <laughs> <laughs> Shoot. All right. So, Danny, you brought you brought this to me. And, like, I don't remember exactly. I think it might have been, like, on a weekend or, like, a Friday night. Yeah, it was a Friday evening. When and I, I basically ignored it until Monday because I was like, oh, whatever. But it turned out it was a big deal. T tell <laughs> us Tell us what happened. <laughs> Uh, someone's been, um, slowly feeding in patches and commits to LibXE so that the uh, one, wait, wait, the wait, build time. Li LibXE is, is what? LibXE is the compression engine that is extremely slow, but because it compresses so well, everyone's been adopting it over the last 10 years. And almost everyone uses it to distribute their software, their patches and everything. So wait, wait, that's almost every OS so these days. The place that LibXE exists in the industry is um, it's it's an intense amount of compute, but of course, compute's getting cheaper all the time. Mm -hmm. But it packs the data down basically better than anything else, and so it's gotten widely adopted on all sorts of things. So I I know SSH uses it. Um, you're saying it's super popular in software distribution. Where else might we see this? Um, I don't think it's used too much outside of software distribution too much. I mean, other than the random person that wants to usually compress something, but using like 7-zip. But mostly, it's the software providers have adopted it because it compresses so well and they don't care how long it takes. But most so other people using, care how long. If you're using 7-zip, you're using this this code, is that right? By default, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And of course, if you're distributing software, if you're connecting to anything over SSH. Um, uh, so, okay, back into the story. Someone what? <laughs> I don't think SSH actually uses it. I have to look. I oh, it does. It does. In fact, that was, uh, that was the target. Um, but 
I keep so saying different things about the target, but the point was that it would open a SSH backdoor. But I don't think it was trying to make SSH itself vulnerable, which I hear confusing about. But I didn't see Maybe. that when I was researching it, but it was early in the research back then, too. Well, and I think it took some time to sort of figure out what yeah. was going on because um, this person, um, fake person, real person, whatever person, it was like five years ago that they like joined the project or something like that. It was, yeah, it wasn't that they believe that at least five of these different people that committed these one-off changes and that were all the same person. Yeah. Over a period and, of years, right? Yeah. And lately... They submitted a little change back then. It feels like they were testing the waters. Now, and what I lately, see... Yeah, they submitted a code to change the um, testing chain. That's right. Yeah, which is important because it wasn't even in the source. They, they did make some changes in the source code to make it vulnerable. But the to actual... Use the, to ignore the failed test chain. Yep. But the, the actual payload code was in a unit test packed yeah. away in a binary object that only gets used in environments that were not used in the normal testing environment. So mm -hmm. it wasn't caught, it wasn't caught in the XC project in that team. And it, and it wasn't caught by uh, Debian, Fedora, who, who imported this into their, their uh, platforms? Debian imported it, but it was only in testing. It didn't actually go out to Anyone, and, unless they purposely put their system on testing. And but, IBM's Red Fedora Hat. Fedora did automatic push it. Yeah, and IBM's Red Hat brought it into Fedora as well, right? Alpine brought it in, but they were the same thing with Debian. It was only in testing. Yeah. Well, it was in and testing, it but it else. almost made it out the door. And I understand a random guy was just like, why is this slow in his environment, right? Um, and he sounded the alarm. But one has to wonder... I mean, this was a very sophisticated attack. We've had supply chain attacks like this before in the open source world and that we've caught. And they, yeah, we haven't. I don't think we've seen one this low. This was very sophisticated. This was either someone's like life plan or a very, very patient state actor. And I'm not sure that fingers have been pointed, but um, the uh, the potential for harm was certainly humongous. Um, so it was stopped, but one has to wonder, like, if they ran this campaign, campaign, are there like five other similar campaigns happening right now, right? That we have. And where could they be? Yeah, where could they be? So uh, I'm, I'm just scratching my head. Um, you know, I, <laughs> we use open source code in our, in our platform, and I think everyone else I talk to also uses open source code in their platform. So uh, yeah, it's scary. It's scary. And this uh, was a build caught, time, so I'm not sure we would catch it when we're just using it because it existed when you were building the package. Something this sophisticated, yeah, we probably wouldn't have caught it. Um, this was okay. incredibly, incredibly sophisticated. Uh, Open source code suddenly seems like a weird idea. It. <laughs> this is what this was Microsoft's pitch to kill Linux like 20 years ago. Um, I think it's they, even weirder that the guy that caught it caught it. I mean, who benchmarks just their compile time on their code? Right, right, right. Well, some people do that. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it. it's not the usual thing. <laughs> I know we just click the deploy button, and uh, it just sort of happens. And <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, uh, yeah. So I uh, hats off. Hats off to our, our friend, and I I feel remiss not to uh, um, just thank Andres um, Freund for for finding this. So um, he was micro benchmarking. <laughs> so I I I made a joke about you know what's up with cybersecurity school earlier at the beginning of the call. Um, and in the beginning of this class that I am, am taking now, they had us watch this hour long like PBS special um, that was like this. It basically walked somebody through an attack, um, a cyber attack in like 1980. Um, 
and the way that they identified that something was wrong was there were a 30 there was a one 31 cent charge that wasn't accounted for in the whole accounting system um and josh's point of uh you know a few a few uh megabits off or millibits or whatever the hell off and noticing that like you know things are supposed to add up things are supposed to you know and you should notice those things i believe that's how most things are noticed but having the knowledge to know that that's abnormal is a feat in itself yeah that's a good point yeah and i i think in this case um there was a there's a significant amount of luck because i remember reading some of um okay. the early reports and the guy was like yeah i only accidentally stumbled across this thing and and then once i accidentally stumbled across it only accidentally figured out what was going on right um mm. it 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 may not have gone that direction right sometimes curiosity cures the cat all right so we're all afraid of sl supply chain attacks um and uh but you know this has been in the news for a while um solar winds got hacked a few years ago that was a big deal yeah. um and uh there's I don't need to dig into that. that. There was the theoretical grain of rice microchips getting snuck onto server boards that was never really proven or disproven from, uh, and routers from uh, they 10 years ago. I, this is just going to keep coming back. We need to care about everything that, that comes into our IT system um, and secure it back to its source. And it's going to take a while. What do we got next, Matt? What are we cooking? Oh, boy. We got to lock it down. All right, guys, I, I don't mean to scare you all. I'm not going to, we're not going to go deep into cyber war. What we're going to ah! talk about, <laughs> I mean, we're all in a cyber war. We've been at cyber war for years. Um, and, uh, you know, Alex, Alex Stamos, like ripped, ripped the uh, alarm cord over at Facebook back in 2016 and said, guys, the global cyber war is already happening. Um, he ended up getting forced out of Facebook for his efforts. Um, because no one in Facebook wanted to deal with fighting a cyber war that the public didn't realize existed. But the reality is those of us in the security community have been eating and breathing it for years. Uh, it's not new. Um, state it's actors war, get in, war hounds, you. State actors are involved throwing, throwing cyber missiles at each other. And then governments are hiring private security contractors in cyber the same way they hire private security contractors in not cyber. And the oh. thing about hiring a cyber contractor is you know you're you may be handing them some tooling you may be asking them to develop tooling and unlike physical weapons that you can sort of track around the planet those those state level contractors right um they've got like a a commercial side of their business too and that the, the, the tooling and 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 the skill like basically leaks out everywhere and so what's skill what's a What's a what's a what's cyber war and what's not cyber war in the land of cyber crime? I have, I actually well, it's like have mercenaries, no you know. Right. It's literally that. I mean, it quite literally is that in the cyber playing field. You know, it's like I'm going to pay you to go point your gun over there. So that's the backstory. Uh, I think um, if if you you all haven't heard it already, you're all already in cyber war. Okay. It's already happening. It's happening right now. You just dropped talking. fools. You just dropped fools into a battle royale that they didn't know they were signed up for. So, so that's what's happening in the world. Um, meanwhile, there's been this Merck lawsuit. Um, they had a big cyber loss back in, I believe, 2017, and um, turned out it may have been a state actor that took them down. Um, they're not the only ones that have been hit by state actors in the private sector. What's a um, state actor? Sta well, government. Exactly. Paint Who knows? <laughs> it's, yeah. it could well, be. You, you mean more than you mean, I don't like the term state actor cause it, it's so. It's an obtuse in security industry state. term and yeah. you're right. Um, but let's make this clear. These are governments, government contractors, right? Or, um, people with government resources, right? And uh, they're fighting the same, with the cy same cyber tooling that uh, that people without, you know, support of the government are utilizing, but they're better at it. 
Okay. And they've got, uh, and unfortunately, unlike a cyber criminal that you only have to make your security good enough so that the target, the loss, right, is too expensive to achieve, right? So if you, if you make your security at a high enough level, you'll be safe from people who have to invest up to the level that they can obtain, right, to get past your security. But a state actor will go way past the point of um, return on investment in, in pure dollars that can be captured because they've got other aims and their aims could be all sorts of things. And Merck got hit, but, and, and that was, I believe in 2017, but a few years before that, um, I don't know if you're all aware of this, um, uh, there was uh, a, a, an attack against um, uh, Ukraine in the first Crimean war and um, FedEx's TNT was down globally as a result of that. Um, I believe one of the large shipping companies, I don't remember which one, was also impacted. Uh, global operations took a huge hit there. Um, state actors, right? So this lawsuit um, from Merck against their insurer as a result of the fact that the insurer didn't want to pay out. The insurer said, and I don't remember the exact legal excuse, basically force majeure, it was war, we're not responsible. Um, and Merck differed. Merck's opinion differed, right? Um, they, they battled it out for literally that, that, that suit dragged on for years and years and years and was recently settled. Um, and we don't know what the terms are, but the result as it was dragging through the courts has been several, several years of the insurance industry adding uh, fr from the top up at the capacity markets all the way down to the carriers adding language um, that affects everyday people looking for cyber insurance that basically says if this was the result of a cyber war actor, cyber, you know, a st state actor, um, we're not going to pay out. And it's all extremely messy. And the insurance industry um, thinks that they have this narrowly defined thing to define what's war and not what's not war. But I, I just don't think um, living in the cybersecurity industry that that's even possible to draw that line. So uh, the, these are out there. The Merck, the Merck lawsuit, which was huge, was settled. And because it was settled, it was never decided in court what the result would have been, which was the reason why the insurer was willing to settle. No one in the insurance industry um, wanted that case decided in court. Um, yeah, no, nobody wants that precedent set. Yeah, and and Merck was happy to take their uh, you know take their money as well. And I bet uh, I think it's too what did they get? Just... I could I could flip, but here I'll say. Well, it. I the the terms aren't the terms aren't public, but. Um, what are you talking about? It's right here. Oh, is it? Do we have the terms? Oh, well, it, it was, was it was one point four billion dollars in coverage, but I don't know what the I don't know what they want in their settlement. So it's yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. but it was it was it was a one point four billion dollar claim. Um, so it, I'm sure it was substantial. <laughs> it it was probably less than one point four billion, but uh, I would guess it was in the nine digits, <laughs> someplace. Um, maybe high nine digits. Um, I don't know. Call, call um, me. Well, uh, what I do digits. know is this is just going to keep keep happening where these disputes are happening, where claims are getting denied because a state actor may or may not have been involved. Um, and let me, let me say, it is extremely hard to attribute when a state actor is involved. You know, like I said, if those tools leak out of the state and they're picked up by a teenager in a dorm room, does that count as a state actor? Like, when well, what if on... similarly, what if uh, a teenager is hired by somebody that they don't know is asking them to do, you know, you could, right. you could, you could hire enough people to do small enough pieces of a large enough project that nobody has committed the yeah. crime. So the, the, the problem with this is that attribution in cyber is basically impossible. Um, by attribution, we mean pinning the blame on someone specific. Um, and the cybersecurity industry has mostly given up on this. Um, we don't try to attribute because it's almost impossible. We say we think it may be. It's likely to be. And we don't even name specific countries or nations. We name what we call advanced threat actors, right? And we just have nicknames for them. We think it was this advanced threat actor, which we think might be, for example, North Korea. Right. Which is we're going to have a discussion about that in a moment. But 
Uh, we don't really know. The best, biggest brains in the industry don't know. The, the, the idea that anyone in the insurer can actually make a determination doesn't seem right to me, but it hasn't been tested in court. And you, you all should be really scared about what coverages you have. Don't think that don't you are be scared. Be safe. <laughs> don't well, be scared, but be aware and be, be aware. Thoughtful. Be aware that the insurance isn't going to save you. The insurance isn't going to save you. You need to do your own efforts to secure yourself as well. So, well said. Well said. All right, that's my. Wait, wait, I got one more question on this. Is it true purple locks are more secure? <laughs> true. Well, <laughs> okay. Blue locks are more secure, according to marketing. However, purples are more hackery. So. <laughs> okay. You got a little blue on the side of it. <laughs> All right, we can go to the next one. Which do you, do you guys all know that the reason why our background's blue is because it's the cover, color of security? <laughs> I thought you were just a big Seahawks fan. <laughs> oh, Screen Connect. Um, so inside the MSP community, the people that I, you know, a lot of a lot of you listening are in the MSP community. I mean, this was this was huge, right? Uh, one of our one of our biggest. Um, most loved or unloved, depending on who you are. Um, I know I've got lots of great friends over at ConnectWise who was responsible for Screen Connect. Um, really had to scramble. They really had to scramble. Um, I, I know was, nothing about this one. Forgive me. Well, what, what I happened? was getting excited to have the CISO speak at uh, CompTIA CCF from 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 uh, from ConnectWise, but he got he kept pulled into this Screen Connect debacle because. Uh, basically, and, and so let, let me just look at my notes here. So, uh, we think, we think North Korea, um, uh, developed a piece of malware. It was a espionage toolkit. Okay. And, um, they found some zero days in screen connect, which is a remote desktop tool. So, um, the North Koreans were using it to get at all sorts of end clients, you know, because Screen Connect's a, a um, desktop control tool for MSPs, um, you, you know, by, by, by leveraging that zero day, the North Koreans were able to get into many MSPs that were using this tool before it was, before it was resolved or upgraded. And yeah, go ahead. We've talked about zero days before. Um, are they intentionally put there or are they just identified that they are well, there or i guess maybe uh, both. mostly they're not intentionally put there um there's been a few cases where people do put back doors and systems and if they haven't been discovered they would be a zero day on the day that they were pub you know publicly disclosed but mostly these are mistakes that people make in in their, in their coding or think problems that they didn't think about when they were creating code and um writing code is really complex so there's lots of things we could do to be better programmers but essentially um oh like you know, the thing that happened this week the um um now my mind goes blank was that thing that starts with a p for ssh on windows was there a put, putty? Uh, yeah, putty. Yeah. yeah, they had some um, hashing algorithm, and it's just been used over and over the years. And when the new ECC algorithms came out, they were too large for the hashing algorithm. The hashing algorithm started padding zeros and made oh. it insecure. Not that it was um, a vulnerability then, but over the years it became a vulnerability because it wasn't large enough. That's a really, really... Dan, so these things awesome. can sneak up on you too, right? That you may you may not have a vulnerability, and then the environment around you may change, and then it becomes a vulnerability, right? And that's certainly true. Your your software is only secure, or your systems are only secure in relationship to their environment. Um, but it, you know, it with the Screen Connect. So, and I don't have the timeline in front of me, guys. You'll 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 have to go read up on it if you want to look at the timeline. So. Um, the North Koreans released their espionage toolkit. They start hacking and clients all over the place. Um, uh, Connectwise is informed that these these bugs are are exist and are being taken advantage of by an espionage toolkit. Uh, and I say espionage is like sort of a nice word because th the fact is the North Koreans have a big um, 
they, they make a lot of money off this stuff. Most most governments have other other aims. The North Koreans have this as a revenue source. But in any case, um, that's happening. Um, and we've got uh, ConnectWise is they've got a problem, which is Screen Connect isn't just on their systems. It's it's on these servers at service providers all over the place, right? So they gave everyone notice that hey, you guys need to patch. But then they also and I by the way. I think Connect ConnectWise is handling this situation is textbook grade A. Um, it's it's a model of what everyone else should do in this case. Um, they were extremely transparent on day one. They told everyone what was happening when the patch was available. They told everyone here's the patch. You need to upgrade if you're on these versions. And then they set a deadline which was very short. Your Screen Connect servers are going to stop working if you don't upgrade. And it was just a couple of days, and then they shut it down. And at, at that time. Uh, the people using this toolkit would have been locked out. Um, a lot of cleanup that had to happen after that. And um, I'm I'm glad that we don't use Screen Connect in our shop, but I know many of our, our clients do. And of course, if you um, uh, feel free to reach out to us if you have questions. But this this was a big deal because it hit close to home. You know, most most vulnerabilities that our industry, you know, the service provider ecosystem have to deal with are with pieces of software from outside our industry, right? But Screen Connect was targeted at our market segment specifically to take advantage of the service provider community and the increased access that they have to end customer machines. And that's new. Um, and we all need to be taking care that the tool suites we're using are safe and that when, when it proves that there's a problem that we were able to react quickly um, at, at our own tool suites, not just you know, what's in the client environment, but what we're using as service providers. So that's my takeaway from this anyway. Well, guys, I think we did it. I think we did, did our first recap of a quarter of uh, the cybersecurity industry. Well, and we're, I'm already like keeping furious notes because, you know, we're halfway into quarter two and I, I can't wait to, uh, oh, yeah. to catch up there as well. Oh, yeah. I like this. What did you guys think? This was pretty fun. I thought we, uh, I thought, I thought that was interesting. Yeah, it's a great format. I think it's a so, good format. Uh, All right. We well, don't have I... anyone to wave bye to except for audience. So oh, I'll still do it. I'm gonna still <laughs> yeah. do the goodbye we'll thing also. Here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna see about. Uh, I'm gonna take a quick look and make sure I get what next week is correct. Forgive me for I'm not prepared. Oh, that's right. All right. So uh, thank you so much for everybody uh, joining us. I hope you enjoyed another MSP Cyber Roundtable. And I hope that you guys are primed for an exciting weekend. Um, next week, we are going to be having David and Dean um, joining us from Helped. We're going to be uh, breaking, open, breaking open the anatomy of a service ticket. Um, that's going to be a ton of fun. Everybody have a great weekend. Make sure to like us on LinkedIn and uh, check out our YouTube for more educational content. Bye, everybody. Bye.